going to see what we're supposed to see. We're not going to be Pharisees, and we're going to lift people up, put them into ministry, set them into the church, and see revival in these last days. Because at the end of us is the beginning of him, that his strength is made known through our weakness. Yeah, I can't, but he can we are ambassadors for Jesus. We are called according to his purpose to declare the good news while there's time. Doesn't matter if they receive it or not. That's not up to us. Our job is just to declare it. My son who was lost, he never saw him as anything other than a son. It's time to come in. We got church. Church. We just want to thank you for joining us in the service today. If you are online, you need to come down to the church because you will not be able to see us. You will not actually, now that I remember, you won't actually be able to hear us. So it doesn't really matter. I'll tell you tomorrow. So anyway, we want to welcome you to the service today. We want you to stand up and get ready to worship. What are we here to do? We're not, yes, we gather. Yes, we love one another, but we're, we're, we're here to worship the King of Kings. He's worthy of our praise. Stand up and worship the Lord our God. Father God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you, Father God, for the visitors. I thank you, Lord God, for us all gathering together to worship you. We have come prepared to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We thank you, Lord God, for the gathering, for bringing us from all over to here, to Victory Church Red Deer. And we just thank you, Lord God, for your presence is in this house. We worship you this morning in Jesus' name. So everybody stand up. Darkness tremble at the ground below its feet. 
darkest hour. Well, 
to your father. I'm no longer. It's a choice. It's a choice. I'm here to choose you, Lord. I am. Because I am a child of God. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are your children, Lord God. We choose you today. We choose you. We thank you for your presence, Lord God. We thank you for your presence here. To sense his presence here, it's here. He's with you. Yes. He sees you. Yes. He's here. Amen. We just thank you for your presence here this morning, Lord God. We just thank you for it. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name. You can be seated. I'm going to call Kevin up, and then Rich is going to come up. and, and uh... Hallelujah. We were in our prayer room this morning, and Pastor David said, you know, he was very excited for this morning and for this service. And I believe there's a word here, not just for one person, but for a few people. And it's uh, out of Matthew 18, and we all know it. It's talking about ch children having faith. And it says, having faith like a child is no easy feat. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells us, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Having faith like a child requires putting aside our will. This way, our opinions and misconceptions do not get in the way of trusting Christ wholeheartedly. And I had Pastor Terry Murphy of Regina spoke to me, and he says, you know, it's amazing when you believe like a child, God will do what you're asking for or what you're believing for. Now, sometimes it takes a little bit, and sometimes it happens right away. And it was an amazing thing when God shared that with me and then bringing the word. And then this morning when you said that you're excited, I have such an excitement because I believe God is going to do something this morning. Not just in one person, but I believe in this congregation. Amen? Amen. Where's Rich? <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Kevin. How's everybody doing? Wow, that's pretty good. Not bad. I am so excited to be able to be up here again to talk to all of you because I need your help. And there's a lot of people here today, so I, I need everybody's help. Not just one of you, not just a couple of you, not just one family, but I need everybody's help. We have a mission coming up, and it's only like five, six weeks away, and we're off to Thailand. Seven of us, amen? Let's see who's all going. Wave your hands up in the air if you're going. I'm going to go too, I guess. All right, so there's seven of us going. It's very exciting. The ministries over there had asked if we could bring some things. So I have a list. You might have seen it because I might have already pushed some uh, pamphlets into your hands over the last week or so. It's because I really want to be able to take this stuff to Thailand. There's seven of us going. That means we have 14 bags we're going to check. That's like almost 700 pounds of stuff. Amen? 700 pounds. I think we have about 700 pounds worth of things that we could take. So let's fill those bags and get them out to the people in Thailand. Amen? Now, we also have this coming Friday on the 15th of September, we're doing our fundraising dinner. It's going to be fun. We're going to do it right in here. And get this. It's a home-cooked meal from our Filipino families. Amen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's not going to be any spring rolls because I'm eating them all. Okay? Stay away from the spring rolls. That's just how it's going to be. Anyways, we really need your help with this. The tickets are $30. I believe we have 20 tickets left to sell. This money we really need for the work that we're going to do there. But I want you to think about something. This isn't money for the team. This isn't money for me. This is God. You know, we are called to go out into the world. And we're doing it. We're called to make disciples. And we're going to be doing it. But you know what? It's not for our team. It's for the people we're serving. It's not about us. It's about the people that we're going to serve. And I have a picture I want to, you to paint into your head. And then I'll go away. But I want you to think about the schoolhouse that you went to school in. When you were maybe in grade 3 or 4, maybe grade 5. You got the picture in your head? And I want you to think of that schoolhouse being made out of bamboo. 
and having a grass roof. Now I want you to picture the schoolhouse not just on the street or down the block from where you grew up, but I want you to imagine it across the river. And across the river, it's surrounded by trees. But not just the forest of perhaps where you grew up. But now this forest has bamboo growing up out of it. It has other vegetation that you're not sure of what it is. And now you hear the footsteps of children going into the school. But they're different, these footsteps, because these footsteps are the footsteps of 30 kids that don't have a mom and dad. They don't have family. These kids are going up into there, and they live somewhat on their own. They don't have a store to get clothes. They barely have food most of the time. Now this, these kids are looked after by four, five adults, I think maybe six sometimes, and they're just people from the same area that have just decided to look after these children. Does that look like your schoolhouse that you grew up in? No. Now I want you to imagine that you can still hear those footsteps on going up and down the steps into this small little schoolhouse hut, their home. But now they're running out of the house. And they're going around to the other side of the school. And before them is a hole about three feet by ten feet long. And it's about five feet deep. This is their safety. Because when the planes start flying overhead and they start bombing the place where they live, where the jets are fighting and shooting in that area, the kids leave their home and their school, and they come and they line up in this hole in the ground. How many, raise of hands, how many people have had to hide in a hole at school? None of us. So we're not going there to serve ourselves. We're going there to serve the people. Every dollar that we get from this dinner, every donation we get is going to those people. Kim and Angelie have been serving in this area. And the only reason Angelie can get over there is because she's Thai. And they trek through mud and across this river to get to these people, to preach to them, to teach them. And these kids receive from them because they're willing to serve. And they go out of their way to do it. And a lot of the donations on here are going to go to those kids, to those people that are trying to teach. So when I come up here and say, I need your help, I don't need your help. But the kingdom of God needs your help. Amen? So I just invite you all to come out. We're going to have a lot of fun on Friday. It's going to be a good time. And once again, if you want spring rolls, you're going to have to bring them yourself. Thanks, Rich. All right. So I get the privilege of receiving the offering today, and uh, we don't always make this a formal thing in this church because we know that a lot of people, if you know to give and you give if you want to give, and you know where the debit machine is and you know how to give cash and you know how to put money in an envelope. But I just wanted to encourage you this morning uh, with 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 4. And I believe that God put this on my heart this morning. Now, regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure to give to the churches in Galilee. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along, then I'll travel. And I, I brought this, and, and I just wanted to just share with you some of my own and Kevin's struggle with um, regularly disciplining ourselves to give to back to God, what he's already given to us. And, and as you, most of you know, we've been Christians uh, since we were 26. So um, it's a 
few years ago. <laughs> so uh, we were Christians seven years when we came into Victory in 2000. So there you go, do the math. And uh, we've been part of Victory Churches for 23 years. Now, it's not Victory Churches that helped us, but we, we were encouraged along the way. But in the year of 2000, we started to really hunger for God in a way that we never had before. And we sang this song that this morning that was a fairly new song. I haven't heard it before, and it said, I want to know you, Jesus my Lord, Jesus to know you and to know you more. And I remember in 2000, Kevin and I in the new year just crying out to God, I want to know you more, God. I believe that what your word says is true, but if it's true, I'm not seeing the evidence of that in my own life. I'm not seeing that evidence of that in the church we were attending. And not that they didn't love the Lord, but they came in the door and walked out. Came in the door and walked out. It was so empty. And I was tired of playing church. That's really, and I would, Kevin and I were like, if this is all it is, why are we going? And we were so hungry for God that we were desperate to really let ourselves go to a church that frightened us. And Victory Church frightened us. And we heard about it in Moose Jaw three different times. People told us about the Victory Church. And, and so we, we came to the Victory Church with fear and intrepidation because some of the things that we do at Victory is we love God and we get really excited, but we also have some things that we believe in the doctrine of the church and, um, and they did too, but it wasn't exercised. And so this was something new. Anyway, we came to the church and immediately God was speaking to us about giving, tithing. We call it tithing, 10%. And we're like, well, we've tried that before, and it didn't work. And God really spoke to our hearts and said, you, you said you wanted to abandon your ways. You said you wanted more of me. You said you were willing to lay everything down. I want you to lay this down. And let me show you that I will be there for you. And so he doesn't promise us the song, I beg your pardon, I didn't promise you a rose garden. You know, God doesn't promise us that everything is going to be perfect, everything's going to be grand, everything. But he promises us that he will be with us. He promises us that he sees us, he's there. And so Kevin and I gave. And that was the first time, and God knows the difference, right? Your heart, he knows your heart. And that was the first time that we had ever given and just let it go and trusted God. And that week, our landlord came to us and asked us if he could lower our rent. <laughs> he asked permission to lower our rent. Now, I'm not saying if you do that, 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 that will happen. I'm not, like I said, God doesn't promise those things. But for us, at that stage of our life, we were at that point ready to feel God's presence in our life, and God has always been with us. I want to encourage you, as those words said, I want to know you, Jesus my Lord, Jesus to know you, to know you more. I want to encourage you to let go of everything, and I mean everything, everything, let it go. Because to live for the Lord, and we've been living passionately for God, has everything always been grand? Has our bank account always been abundantly full? Uh, the answer is no. Have we been sick? Have we gone through death? Absolutely. But God has always been with us. And we've always trusted him from that time. He's really showed us, I'm here with you. And so I want to... I want to encourage you to let go whatever you've held on to. And if it's money, let it go. Because I can tell you, you try to squander it away. It's never there when you need it. You spend it anyway. Trust God. Trust him with everything. Just let everything go and trust him. Trust him with your kids. Trust him with your life. Trust him with your marriage. Trust him with your finances. God will never leave you. He's always there. 
So, Father God, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you, Lord God, for this amazing day. This is the day the Lord has made, and we get to rejoice and be glad in it. And we just give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Pastor Dave. All right, hallelujah. Wow, it's good to see all your faces here this morning. Welcome. Hey, uh, the kids are still here. All right, kids, you can probably go downstairs to... You don't want to hear an old guy like me talking this morning, right? It'll be more fun. Youth, too. Like, why would you stay up here when you got PB and J downstairs? Pastor Brad and Jess, like, all right. Hey. Yeah. It's a good day. Today is the day the Lord has made. Hallelujah. Man, so we're going to start today... I just want to start off by reading the word today. So we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And that's the scripture verses we're going to use today come out of there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We'll start right at the beginning of the chapter. Okay. Uh, it says, <clears throat> I'm reading out of the NLT version right now. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. Oh boy. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. That does not sound very good. But this, listen to this. Verse 4. But God. I love that, right? But God. Man, I didn't just make that up. I say that all the time. It's right in the scripture. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead, because of our sins. He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So God can point us in all future ages as examples of the wealth of His grace. We are living proof here in this room, right? Praise God. As examples of the wealth of His grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by His grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Well, Lord, I, I'm just so thankful for Your Word today, God. I am thankful for who You are. I'm thankful for the truth in those words that we read together this morning. We thank you for your saving grace upon us, Lord. We thank you that there is a but God in those scriptures, that no matter where we are, we're, man, you're much bigger than that, and you made a way for us to have a relationship with you. Uh, so, Father, I just pray right now that you put your words in my mouth, God, that your message would come forth in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, that's the word of the Lord, amen? So we're doing this sermon series called Got Questions, because we all have questions, right? And sometimes we don't know when to ask them, or how to ask them, or where we can ask them. So a few weeks ago, we put a box out in the foyer with little cards, and you can write your questions in there and put them in. And we're taking some of those questions, some of your actual questions about faith, and about God, and about, about the Bible, and we're going to try to... Look at those biblically together in this room. And some of them aren't easy questions. They aren't all just uh, questions about, you know, 
whatever, fill in the blank. I got nothing. <laughs> but <laughs> I got all hard questions. No, Some of them aren't easy questions, though. And the thing is, I know we all sit with those questions. And sometimes if we aren't able to answer them or we get them stirred up in our own head and we start to make up our own ideas of, of maybe what the answers are, and it can lead to confusion, it can lead to doubt, it can lead to all sorts of things. So we want to get these questions right out in the open. And, and let's look at them because God's Word is true and there are answers in the Word of God for just about everything we wonder. And to the point, maybe I can't answer all your questions because I'm just a man. <laughs> I'm not that smart. But the Word of God can. God can, and even if I can't answer it, one day you'll know. So anyways, we're going to try to do this together. And I've talked before about our youth. That's been the goal of Tara and me over the years of working with our kids, is how do we get them to develop their own faith, right? A faith that isn't, they don't just come to church anymore because I told my son, okay, you got to get dressed and you got to come to church. We want them to want to serve the Lord and have their own faith in serving God themselves. And part of that is letting them ask the questions that need to be asked and not just saying, believe because I said so. No, believe because the Word of God is true. There's a difference. So, the question today that we're going to choose, right out of the box is, how do you find your identity through God? That's a big one. I was going to answer like three or four little questions today, but man, I started working on this one, and it's going to be a long answer. So ushers, you should probably lock the doors because people are going to want to leave before I'm done. How do you find your identity through God? Wow. Wow. And it's no wonder people ask that question because we've been talking about it as a church. I say it all the time. We need to have our identity in Christ and nothing else. That's where our identity needs to be found because Christ is the only thing that's steady in our lives, right? God is faithful. If we have our eyes on anything else, it's going to be fleeting, right? So we need our identity in Christ so that we can be rooted firm as we go out into the world. And we talk about, in this church, what's the job of the church? It's to equip the saints for what? Equip the saints for the works of the ministry, right? That's the job of the church. So part of that is helping you realize your identity in Christ. And so thank you for that question. It is so right. But before I get to that, I'll start to talk about that in a minute. Uh, well, one thing I think is for us to realize our identity, the way to find our identity through Christ or through God is to start to recognize the difference between truth and lies. We've talked about that before too. Like there's really only two options to the things you say, the things you hear, the things you believe. There's truth and there's lies. And our world might talk about in a lot of ways, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. No, that's wrong. There's truth and there's lies. Those are the only two options. So we need to be able to discern what the lies are so that we can hear the truth. And that's when we can begin to realize what our identity is, what God has made us to be. So, anyway, before I get there, uh, who here has a watch on right now? Don't worry, I'm not going to take it. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. You don't see as many anymore. How many of you have a real watch? Not just one of those cell phone -y thingies, right? That's right. I like watches. I don't know why. I've always kind of liked to wear watches. This one's broken. It was, it stopped working this morning. I don't know. It was $20 at Shoppers Drug Mart, so I'd probably get what you pay for, right? Well, who here's heard of the company Rolex? Right? Rolex. I don't know much about watches. My kids are into watches, so they tell me about watches so that I don't have to look like a fool in front of everybody. The same reason they pick my shoes out, right? <laughs> but I've heard of Rolex, and I know that's a, that's a good watch, right? And there's three types of people in the world. There's those that have a Rolex <laughs> because they could afford to pay the price, right? 
and there's those that would never own a Rolex because they're way too expensive. And even if you had the money, why would I spend that much money on a watch? Doesn't make any sense. And then there's the third type of people. And they're the ones that maybe got their Rolex off kind of a website from somewhere that it, you know, uh, rolex.org.com.edu.wish.com, yeah, where you go on and it's 50 bucks instead of 5,000 bucks, right? That's the third kind of group. And you know what? I was in that third kind of group for a little while. You know, except it wasn't from a website. It was literally a guy on a beach who opened his jacket, just like you'd see <laughs> in the movies. And I bought this a watch, like, and my friend was with me. I was traveling with the university, and my friend was there, and he's like, wow, that looks real. Like, you can't even tell the difference. That's, that's the real thing. And my friend was obviously an expert, so I said, okay, well, I gave the guy whatever I gave him. It probably worked out to about 15 bucks Canadian. And I had this watch. It looked exactly like the real thing. And I was like, yes, look at this. I've got this confidence on my wrist, like, I'm the man now. And I wa everywhere I walked, I was just like, <laughs> check it out. I got a Rolex. It's real. Look at this thing here. I don't know. I was trying to impress my future wife or something like that. I don't know what was going on, but look at this. This isn't a Rolex, by the way. It's a Broken Shoppers Drug Mart watch. <laughs> but here's the thing. That Rolex watch, I don't even know if it was a whole day and the thing literally fell apart. <laughs> it like just the face came off and the hands popped out and I'm like, oh man. And instantly that confidence that I had in my watch that I was walking around with, like I was cool, I was dripping, right? Is that the right word? There's no youth in here to roll their eyes at me today. But <laughs> it was shattered with that watch, right? Because my confidence wasn't in anything that was going to last. It wasn't in something that was real, right? And why am I talking about confidence here today? Because I think there's three types of people in the world. There's those that have confidence because they paid the price for it. It's going to cost you something. There's those that don't have any confidence at all. And there's those that are walking around and they put on their fake confidence every day. Their confidence is in something that won't last, that is, you know, at any moment just going to explode. <laughs> so, and you can tell the difference, right? And really it's not, a, why I conf talk about confidence, because it's not really a confidence issue. It's an identity issue. So that's why I'm choosing this question, because a lot of us have an issue with our identity and how to find it. And a lot of us are turning to, to things that aren't real or things that aren't going to last, the fake things. And especially in our society, we hear so many things, so much noise from everybody trying to tell us how we should act, trying to tell us what we should believe, trying to tell us who we are. And we feel that pressure. Right? And we do things. We put on the watch so we can walk in the room and look good. Right? We do these things so that people will see us. We do things for the approval of other people all the time. And when was the last time you did something for the approval of the people around you? Because confidence and identity go hand in hand. And I see it especially in our younger generation, like in our youth. I see this counterfeit confidence of people using everything around to try to define them, to try to please those around us. And we've always been like that. I was like that when I was a kid. I wanted to make my friends like me. I wore my Rolex so people could see me. Right? But here's the counterfeit confidence always tries to build yourself up too. It always seeks to, that's how you tell the difference seeks to exalt oneself, where true confidence walks in the room, and it's more concerned about others. Like, if I really had a Rolex, I wouldn't need to walk like this. I'd just be confident that it's, that's the real thing. I got it. I know what I got on my wrist is money, right? 
I got the real thing. So how often do you do something for the approval of other people? Oh, what you eat, what you wear. You know, I buy these shoes so that I'll look good on stage, right? I'll eat this certain way because then I'll look the way that I think people are, want me to look. I'll wear these clothes so that people won't look at me or maybe that they will look at me. Whatever we do, right? So the question is, how can I find my identity in God? And I know a lot of us here want that. We want that assurance. We want that real thing. We want the confidence, right? And it's impossible to have confidence in something that we're unsure about, that we don't know about. And that's the reason that we aren't confident, is because we don't know, honestly, some of us don't even know who we are. We don't even know who we are. So, who are you? I want to just think about that. I want to hear people thinking about that. I don't want you to blurt out an answer or anything like that, but think about that for a minute. Who are you? Who are you? I mean, so a lot of us, when I asked that question, we thought, well, hey, I'm, uh, I'm Larry. I'm Carol. I'm Tara. Our name comes to mind, right? I'm Jeremy. I'm Richard. I'm Kanye. <laughs> Kanye, hey. No, he's not here. Anyways, <laughs> if he was here, that'd be kind of neat. But Anyway, some of us think of our name. Well, uh, I want you to know something. Your identity is not your name. It's not your name. If it was your name, well, it'd be constantly changing. We can change our name anytime we want to, right? I mean, even Visa has come out with a Visa card where you can put your true name on it, but you're still who you are even if you've changed your name. Tara could change her name to Laura Ingalls Wilder, and she'd be transported to Little House on the Prairie and running downhill all the time if she did that. No, 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 she could change her name to that, but she'd still be my wife. She'd still be a child of God. She'd still be who she is. She'd still be a mother to our children. Right? It doesn't matter what your name is. That's not who you are. Um, and, man, I just think, sorry, you always see me scrolling like this, and it's because I have no idea where I am. <laughs> and it's like, Gee whiz, get back on track. Anyways, it's not your name. It's not your name, right? And I want you to know something, actually, and I talked about this a little bit, but one of the main reasons I'm on this stage, one of the main reasons I became a pastor and said yes to Pastor Chuck when he was retiring is because I want you all to know who you are in Christ. That's one of the main reasons I stand up here and, and talk this way because I think a church filled with people, a generation of people, whether it's the youth or the not youth, uh, <laughs> man, a church filled with people who know who they are, wow, what's going to happen in the city of Red Deer, right? So who are you? Well, first off, you're not your name. That's not who you are, right? You're much bigger than your name. And because something could even happen. We're not, we're not the way we look either. We're not any of that stuff. Because something could happen. And then what? But I think there's uh, three lies. And we're going to talk about three. There's probably more, but I'm going to highlight three lies so that you can recognize them when you hear them. Three lies that we believe about ourselves that get in the way of us realizing our true identity. And three lies that when we hear them, it convinces, we convince ourselves that this is who I am. Right? And then, so I'll do these and then we'll go for lunch. <laughs> but the first lie, lie number one, is I am my gift. I am my gift or I am what I do. 
That's a lie we believe, right? So maybe your name, yeah, I, I'm Dave, right? But that's really not what you think of when you think of, when we ask the question, who are you? You think of, okay, no, I'm an amazing bowler. Like, I'm in the 300 Club, right? Or I'm a, I'm a musician. It's, it's your gift. Or it's what you do. I'm a mom, right? I'm a dad. I'm a welder. We think of those things, right? I'm a teacher. That's the first thing that comes to our mind, right? But, man, I'm Pastor Dave. But what if something happens in my life where I can't be that anymore? Then what? Like I said, everything else is in real, right? They aren't built to last. Even our gift in what we do. Man, what's my gift? Well, let's read what the Apostle Paul says. That God says. And we read it already. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, who you are. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. Okay? Right? We are whose? We are God's masterpiece. I don't belong to anything else or anyone else. I am not my gift. I am God's. I'm God's masterpiece. And I don't know, I've even read this scripture before, and I don't know how many Christians read this and skip over that part. It feels really good because we read it and we're like, yes, I'm a masterpiece. But we forget the part that we are God's masterpiece. And we sometimes go around, yes, I'm a masterpiece. That's why I'm a great bowler. Nobody's ever bowled as good as I have in the city of Red Deer in the history of the world. Because I'm a masterpiece. Right? We skip over that part. I'm a gift to Heritage Lanes. That's who I am. Right? It's dangerous to do this, though, because then we're focused more on the gift than the giver. So you don't belong to your gift. You don't belong to your gift. You don't belong to what you do. You belong to the giver of the gift. Right? When you start to realize that, you'll stop identifying yourself as your gift. Right? You belong to God. And there's so many people. Man, who watched the Grammys this year? It was on in the spring and I talked about this before and I don't even want to talk about it now because I don't want to highlight this sort of stuff, but Sam Smith, singer, he like straight up came right out on stage dressed as the devil and started doing Satan worship right in the stadium, thousands of people, broadcast to millions of people around the world, just straight up devil worship right on stage. And we see in our culture, people forget the giver of their gift whether you're an actor or a singer or an athlete, you realize that Sam Smith, at one time in his life, he was just a kid with a gift. And he forgot about the giver. So it's dangerous to define ourselves that way. Right? He forgot about the giver. He forgot about the God who gave him his gift. So you're not your gift. It's a part of your identity, I guess but it's not the whole you. Paul says, we are God's masterpiece. We're not just anybody, we're God's. We belong to Him. So and we need to understand that. We need to understand that because also when we find our identity in our gifts, it's dangerous because then we look for belonging. We're still looking for belonging. You can be the best bowler and still not belong anywhere. We are God's. It's important we understand that. Because then we're going to look for belonging in all kinds of other places. We'll look for it in relationships. We look for it in the people that we're around. We look for it in our jobs. Maybe this person will give it to me. Maybe that person will give it to me. Maybe drugs will give it to me. Maybe sex will give it to me. Right? Maybe. And we look in all of these places because we don't know whose we are. Only God will give you what you need. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. I'm my gift. No, you're not. I'm what I do. I'm a, no, you're not. 
problems. The second lie I want to talk about this morning that we believe. Maybe I said that one. I said the lie of I am what I am. I would do. I am my gifting. Maybe that didn't resonate with you at all. But for some of you, this one will. And it's this lie that I am not my, sorry, I am my guilt or my shame. Have you been defining yourself by what either you've done in your life or, or things that have been done to you? The wrongs in your life. Have we defined ourselves that way? Right? Because you're more than what you've done. You're more than what's happened in your life. And some of you are constantly thinking and you can't even begin to peel back the layers of finding your identity in, in God because, because of this thing that you did two years ago or this thing that happened to you 20 years ago. And, and that's attached itself to, to your soul in a way. And so that's how you see yourself. You see yourself as this broken, beat down person. You can't see yourself the way that we've been talking about. But that's not who you are either. Okay, that's a lie. That's not who you are. You're not your gift or what you do, but you're also not your guilt and your shame. So I'm going to read another verse here. And guess what? It's the exact same verse we just read. <laughs> but we're going to read a little further in it. So God says, or Paul says here, for we are God's masterpiece. Okay, got that. And then it says, He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. He has created us anew. So we're God's masterpiece. But the second part is, You were created us. He has created us. That means you and me. Anew in Christ Jesus. That means that when you were where you were in your brokenness, he made a way to rescue you, to make you new in Christ Jesus, to be rescued from where you were stuck. And, I mean, I was thinking about a movie. Tara and I were talking, I think, about Tom Hanks movies for some reason. I don't know. But uh, the movie Castaway came to mind. Who here has seen the movie Castaway? That's right, it's about Tom Hanks on an island talking to a volleyball for I don't know how long, but that's basically the gist of the movie. But it got me thinking, it got me thinking about what it means to need to be rescued. Right? So Tom Hanks was stuck on an island, fighting for his life, fighting for survival, but he was stuck. He couldn't get out of there on his own. He needed to be rescued, right? And spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, he was rescued. All right. Whew. But so were we, okay? I get to my point here. And the reason I thought of that is because it got me thinking about what, what, what it means for a person to need to be saved. We often think, okay, Jesus saved me. Well, it meant that I was stuck, right? Right? I needed to be rescued. I couldn't do it on my own. I needed somebody else to do it. But that's what it means. So <laughs> they're stuck. And did you know that when we call Jesus our Savior, we don't just call him that for nothing, right? We call him that because that's what he did for us. That's what he did for you and me. So when we were stuck in our shame, when we were stuck in our guilt, we were stuck in our sin, stuck in whatever it was, fill in the bank, the place that you were stuck. A Savior came to rescue us. That's not who you are. And, you know, when we say those things, when we say, okay, yes, I know what you're saying, Pastor Dave, but I am my guilt. I feel so bad for these things that I've done. Or, man, Dave, you don't know what happened to me. You don't know what happened to me. When we say that defines us, what we're saying is basically, like Jesus, 
Yeah, I know you came for the sins of everyone. I know you did that, God, and it's really great that you came and did that, but this one thing, that wasn't enough. You know, Jesus, that was sweet. Like, thank you, Jesus. But just so you know, this, this addiction, you didn't cover that. When we tie our identity to our guilt and our shame, we're saying Jesus isn't enough. <laughs> Ouch. That's absurd, right? And I'm not denying what you may have done. I'm not saying what happened to you didn't happen. But I'm asking you to accept what Jesus has done. Accept what he's bringing. And maybe when people look at you, I said, we've got to stop letting culture define us. We've got to stop letting people determine who we are. And maybe when people look at you, that's what they see. Maybe they see your brokenness and they define you that way. Well, you know, when man looked at King David, they saw an adulterer and a murderer. When God looked at King David, he saw a man after his own heart. Right? When man looked at Moses, they saw an old stuttering guy who wasn't very willing to do anything. And God looked at him and saw a willing vessel that would lead the Israelites out of Egypt, right? When God, when people looked at Jesus, when the Pharisees looked at Jesus especially, they saw a disruptor, somebody who was going to shake up the way they wanted to live. When God looked at Jesus, he saw his son who was going to save you and I and rescue and I and cover all the sins of man, Right? So God doesn't look at you the way the people around you look at you. He says what? We are God's what? Masterpiece, right? We're not just some project on the side. He made you. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God, right? God looks at you and he sees a purpose, right? You are God's masterpiece. Man, so we got to get rid of that narrative that I am what I came from. I am my guilt. I am my shame. No, you've been set free. You've been made anew. The Word says you have been made anew. You are saved. You are enough. You are purposed. You were created in Christ Jesus anew. Hey, right? So, so that's so the first lie is I'm, I'm, my, I'm what I do. I'm my gift. Right? That's who I am. No, you're not. The second lie is, I'm my guilt and my shame. I'm a product of what I came from. No, you're not. That's a lie. And the third lie is a little more subtle, actually. It could be more dangerous in some ways. And that's that I am my good works. Right? We can fall into danger in that in the church, too in our walk in Christianity. And this has happened to me, where I will be reading my Bible, and I will do devotions, and I'll say my prayers, and it's just kind of checking boxes on a list, and I'm doing it because this is how I have to do it. I'm a Christian, so I need to check this box. Yes, I'll go to small group every week. I'll do my studies. I'll do these things, and then people will see how good of a Christian I'm being. So we can fall into that trap too, that I'm a product of my good deeds, right? That's who I am. I do good things. I volunteer. I do all this good. Look at me, right? We can fall into that as well. And I'm not saying don't do that stuff. It's good. I'm glad you're doing it. I hope we're all doing it. But what's your heart? What's your motives? This says, and we're going to read the same verse again. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He has planned for us long ago. You notice what that says there. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so He could so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Okay, it's not, 
I did the good things He planned for me long ago, so I was created anew in Christ Jesus. Like the order of these words are very important. Right? It's not the good works, it's not the good deeds, it's not the things that you do that create you anew in Christ Jesus. It's the mercy of God, that's all it is. And he does that ultimately, you know, that means that he saved you so that you would follow him and ultimately produce good fruit in your life. It's not because of the good fruit in your life. There's such a difference there. And sometimes we don't understand that. We, we think, okay, I better read my Bible enough and then God will love me. No, no, the love comes first. It's a result of what he has done. Like, we should want to do that stuff. It shouldn't be have-tos. It should be get-tos, right? If it's a have-to, then you need to ask yourself why that is. It should be a get-to. And uh, then you're going to do all these things. He says, come to me first. I'm going to transform you. And then you're going to want to do all this stuff. You're going to want to pray. You're going to want to read your Bible. You're going to want to worship. You're going to want to do these things. So, I'm just my gift. No, nope. I'm just my guilt. No, nope. I'm just my good deeds. No, you're not. You're none of those things. You're not your gift. You're not your guilt. You're not your good deeds. You're his masterpiece. And you're, man, do you, do you realize that you weren't saved just so that you could be saved? You were saved so that, what did it say? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You were saved so that you can affect the people around you. You weren't saved just to sit there saved. So again, we talk about equipping the saints for the works of ministry, and I've said this before, who are the saints? Yeah, that's right. So you have a job to do. You aren't saved just to be saved. You're saved because he has something for you to do. It says it right here in the Word of God. So the next time, though, I want... You to, somebody asked the question, who are you? Think about these things. Think about the fact that, you know, you are God's. You are His masterpiece. He breathed life into your lungs, right? The Bible says that before you were born, He knew you. Man. And He knows you. He knows where you're going to be on your 90th birthday. He does. And he knows that on your 95th birthday, you're going to freak out on somebody. <laughs> and he knows that. But he loves you today. Anyway, he doesn't hold your past against you. He doesn't hold your future against you. He knows you that way. You are God's masterpiece. You know, again, so our salvation isn't the finish line. I was ahead of myself. Aren't you proud of me? He might get out of here in time today, but anyways. <laughs> but man, I just, when you start to realize these things, then you start to put God in a different place in your life. And when you start to define yourself by God, you're gonna, your, your relationship with Him is going to be different. Your relationship with the people around you, it's going to be different. Just like we talked about last week, the way that we are to love our kids, or sorry, we're to love our kids. But the question last week was, how do we love God more than our kids? Right? Well, when we understand who God is in our lives, and we love Him that way, for who He is, and for what He's done, and we realize that we are His, man, it's going to affect everything else we do. We're going to love our kids more than we ever thought we possibly could. And we'll stop searching for identity in Instagram and everything else. We'll stop trying to find our identity in all of these places. It's going to change your prayer life. It's going to change. Uh, I mean, we sometimes pray prayers that are very... I mean, we had a whole generation of people that wanted to eat Tide Pods at one point, right? We had just like a whole generation of kids crying out to their father for Tide Pods. And if you were a good parent, you'd say, you probably don't need to eat a Tide Pod. You should maybe have a banana, something like that. Well, sometimes we're crying out to Jesus for spiritual Tide Pods in our life. And he's like, you don't know what you need. 
You don't know what you need. You need a banana. Come on. But that's what our prayer life is like. But then when we realize we are God's masterpiece and we were created anew in Christ Jesus to do the good things that he has prepared for us to do, our prayers are going to be different. We're going to stop seeking the people around us to identify who we are, to approve of us. Man, and that happened, man, I remember in my life (laughs) when I made the decision to pursue Jesus. And I was, all the friends, all my friends around me, friends that were younger than me were getting married and all these things, and I'm on the, I'm looking for a girlfriend and all of this stuff, and I decided one day, like, and I used to think, man, what is wrong with me? But I decided one day, okay, enough of that, I'm starting to realize what this says. I'm God's masterpiece, I belong to you, so God, I'm just going to pursue you. I'm going to pursue you, God. This is in your hands. I am done with these prayers. But I still pray. I was like, okay, I'm content now, but I still prayed, God, that's still a desire of my heart. I'd like to get married. I'd love to have kids one day. That's a desire I have. But God, if that doesn't happen, my cup is full. I'm okay just pursuing you because that's who I am. My cup is full. So when I was busy pursuing Jesus, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this other girl all of a sudden came in the building who was also pursuing Jesus. And I was like, she came, showed up a small group, and I was like, hey. And she was like, hi. I was like, what's your favorite band? And she's New Kids on the Block. And I said, that band is trash. (laughs) And then I asked her out. And she said, no. (laughs) But I didn't care because my identity wasn't in her answer. It was in Christ. I was trusting in him. I was content. It didn't destroy me when she rejected me. (laughs) But then guess what? Three days later, she came back and invited me to karaoke with her friend. (laughs) Hallelujah. And now... Look what happened. She's sitting right here in the front row. (laughs) But you start trusting God, pursuing Him, trusting in Him. The results don't matter because your cup is full. And you know what's really cool about that? You get together with another person pursuing Jesus. Like this is totally aside, not really part of anything I'm talking about. But both our cups are full. And then when we're together, it spills out to those around us. And that's what we're called to do. That's what we're meant to do. Is our cups should be filled to overflowing by Christ himself because the people around us can never fill our cups that way. So we can affect. We are made, we are his masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus so that we can spill out, do the good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. Wow. So, man, I, I just want you to really know who you are. Right? Who you are. And that's why I'm preaching about this. That's why I chose this question when I saw it in the box. It was actually put in last week. And so I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare for it, but I'm like, this is what we need This is what we need. We need to be able to differentiate between truth and lies. We need to know who we are in Christ. And in order to know who we are in Christ, we need to know what he says. That's how. That's how you find it. And sometimes to know what he says means we've got to tune out what everybody else says. Sometimes we've got to tune out what we say ourselves. So... um. I'm thinking that, Tara, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call my wife up here and we're going to sing a song in just a minute. But I want to uh, do something here. So, um, okay. Sorry, I lost my spot here. I'm done, I think. 
Anyway, I just want every eye closed and every head bowed. I want to do this right now. If, if you're here today, and we've been talking about these things, and, and you just admit, you just know, like, I'm, I'm not very secure. I'm insecure. I don't have really any confidence. And if that's you, and you just admit right now that you're lacking that in your life, just raise your hand right now. Every eye closed, every head bowed. I want to really uh, respect each other's. Yeah, if that's you, there's hands all over the place here. Like, I see your hands. Okay, you can put your hands down. Eyes closed, every head bow. The second question is, if you're here today and you would, you would, you would honestly, openly admit, you're like, I've been faking it. I've had the fake Rolex on my watch. I've, I've had a fake confidence. And I know I want the real thing. With every eye closed and every head bowed, if that's you, just go ahead and lift your hand right now. Yeah. Hallelujah. I see those hands. Okay, you can put your hands down. Okay, so this question is about the things that we talked about here. So, so if, during this message today, if you have been allowing your guilt or your shame to define you, or maybe not, or maybe you've been allowing your gift or the things that you do define who you are, if, if that was you, if you're like, I thought... This is who I was. I, I'm defined by what happened to me when I was younger. I'm defined by what I've done. Or I'm defined by my role in my life. Like, If that's you, fire your hand up right now. And if you've realized that, and you're willing to admit that today, but I, want, I, want, I don't want those things to define me anymore, God. I want, I want you to define me. I want to realize what your word says about me. That I'm yours and your masterpiece. Hands all over the place. My hands up too. You can put your hands down. And the last question this morning is, if you've never met Jesus and you want to meet Jesus for the first time today, you want to know Him as your friend, you want to know Him as your Savior, you want to know Him as your Lord, you've never heard these things before what I created a new in Christ Jesus if you want that to be you and that's you for the first time today go ahead and, and lift your hand in this place lift your hand in this place I see that hand I see that hand okay you can lower your hands here. man okay you can look at me again you can look at me again. Because we're going to create a space right here up front, and I want, I want you to do something. If, if you put your hand up for any one of those questions, I want you to boldly, well, I'm going to pray here in a minute, and, and whenever I say amen, then I want, Tara and I are going to sing a song, but I, I want you to boldly step out of your seat. Come forward and boldly lay that down at the altar. And remember, nobody's watching you. We don't, we don't look to who's coming or who isn't. But at the same time, even if they were, remember what we said. Right? It's not about the people around you. It's between you and him. So if you put your hand up for any of those reasons today, I'd, I'd ask that you'd boldly come forward today. We'll maybe turn the lights down a little bit here so that you can, don't feel like people are watching you, but... Just make that bold step that uh, as an outward representation of what God is doing internally in you right now. Because, and we need to do that because it's a physical sometimes decision. It's a daily decision for us to, to trust God that way. It's something that we could have to actually choose to do. So if that's you, and, and maybe the prayer team can come forward as well. And we'll just be ready. But if that's you, Father, I'm just going to pray. Jesus, 
Jesus, we thank you for every single person in this room, God. We thank you, God, that we are yours, Lord, that we are your masterpiece, God. And I thank you for the decision today that people have made to boldly step out, Lord, and pursue you in this place, God, for the first time, maybe the first time in a long time, maybe for the first time. We thank you, God. And so, Lord, I pray for boldness for each one of them here in this place, God. As we lay it down, as we lay down, as we lay it down, we lay it all down in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you for what your word says. We thank you, God, that your word says we are yours. We are yours. And I thank you, God, that what your word says is true. And when it says we are your masterpiece, we can believe it is true because you are faithful and what you have said is true. And Lord, we thank you that you came down and rescued us, God. So for those of us, Lord, that want to make you our Lord for the first time, Lord, we thank you, God, that you made a way to pull me out from where I'm stuck. Oh, Lord, that you would come down and rescue me. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Lord, I'm tired of living the ways we've talked about. I'm tired of living these lies, God. I want to know you more. I want to pursue you. And I thank you, Lord, that when we pray that prayer, you are faithful to answer it. You are faithful to come through. Because you're the only thing in our life that we can rely on all ways and always. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So just open up your heart to Him. If you've come forward, just lay it down right here and right now as we sing this song. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh. He knows my name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He knows my name. You know us, Lord Jesus. He knows my name. Thank you, Jesus. Sing it out. He knows my name. Know how he walks with me. Thank you, Lord. Oh, how he talks. Oh, how he talks with me. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, how he tells me. Thank you, Jesus. That I am his own. Sing it out. You know my name. You know my name. Praise you, Jesus. You know my name. you comfort me oh how you comfort me yes, Lord. oh how you counsel oh how you counsel me it still amazes me that I am your Now I pour out my heart to you. Yes, Lord, we pour it out in this place, Lord. We pour it out. Thank you, Lord. Here in your presence, I am made new. We are made anew in you, Lord. In Christ Jesus, we are made anew. So now I pour out my heart to you. Yes, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Here it is. 
here in your presence I am made new. Hallelujah, Lord. You know my name. You know my name. It's Jesus. Yes, Jesus. You know my name. Jesus.
to leave Amazing love. if you want to stay here How in this you're welcome to stay but if you need to leave you can leave 
we don't, that's okay. So thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Your love is amazing. You are my king. So, Lord, once again, I pray in Jesus' name that huh, I just pray in Jesus' name that we would understand the words that, you, that were written that are true about who we are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Nothing I can do to let you down Doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now Going through a storm, but I won't go down I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me So I wouldn't drown You've never been closer than you are right now Child, you are in love Child, you are in love You are. 